Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Lord, we love you and we honor you. And we as your children really want to know your heart. And we really want you to share your heart with us. And we ask you, God, to take us deeper, not to treat us just like little babies, but as mature and growing children who can know the Father's heart. Take us deeper. Share your heart with us. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't have any scriptures to put up for you or quotes to put up for you simply because God dropped this in my heart uh, last night and this morning, but we'll have time to turn to these passages. We're going to start in Jeremiah chapter 9. This will parallel the message I preached in the first service, but will not be identical. And if you're ministered to by this, you may want to listen to the message in the first service. I, I really didn't know if I was going to get through the service or the message because my heart was so burdened. And as we were worshiping in the first service, I, it was just hard for me to fully enter in because my heart was so torn. And at one point, Pastor Chris got up and said, let's just give God acceptable worship, whether it's jumping or clapping or on your face or on your knees. I just, I just fell to my knees and began sobbing because the, the reality of, of suffering hit me at that moment. And it was hard to get through the message but whether it's with tears or not, know this comes from the, the depth of my being. We'll start in Jeremiah chapter 8, beginning in verse 20. Here the prophet speaks on behalf of the nation. Jeremiah preached to his people for over 40 years and preached repentance and wept, known as the weeping prophet, because he saw the judgment that was going to come. Remember in Luke 19, Jesus, Yeshua, weeps over Jerusalem because he sees the terrible suffering that's going to come. The prophets would see things as if they were happening in front of their eyes, see the reality, see the pain, and warn their people, repent before this happens, repent before judgment comes. But they didn't repent. So here he speaks on behalf of the people. The harvest is past. The summer has ended. And we are not saved. Then he speaks for himself. Since my people are crushed, I am crushed. I mourn and horror grips me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is there no healing for the wound of my people? And then these words shall quote to you in Hebrew. Me tain roshi mayim. Ve'ni mekor ve'efkeh. Oh, that my head were waters, my eyes a fountain of tears. I'd bewail day and night the slain of my people. Oh, that I had in the desert a lodging place for travelers so that I might leave my people and go away from them for they're all adulterers, a crowd of, of unfaithful people. The burden in his heart is so deep. He wished he had more tears. He, he wished... He could have a greater way of expressing the grief. Then verse 3, many translations will have quotation marks. They make ready their tongue like a bow to shoot lies. It is not by truth that they triumph in the land. They go from one sin to another. They do not acknowledge me, declares the Lord. But there are no quotation marks in the Hebrew. And, and when you're reading it, something's striking here. I worked for years writing a commentary on Jeremiah and was overwhelmed with this as it became deeper and more real to me. I'm going to read verse 2 again. Oh, that I had in the desert a lodging place for travelers so that I might leave my people and go away from them for they're all adulterers, a crowd of unfaithful people. They make ready their tongue like a bow to shoot lies. It is not by truth that they triumph in the land. They go from one sin to another. They do not acknowledge me, declares the Lord. It raises the question, well, who's speaking here? It looked like Jeremiah was speaking, but then it suddenly transitions to God speaking. And when I dug into this, it was 
fascinating to see many commentators wrestle with that. Is that God speaking? Or is it Jeremiah speaking? Or is it one and the same? Because the prophet carried the burden of God. Is God saying metaphorically, I wish I had more tears to weep for the destruction coming on my people? If Yeshua represents the heart of the Father, wept over Jerusalem, he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Can we say metaphorically speaking that God weeps over the suffering of his people? Richard Warmbron persecuted, imprisoned, for a period of many years, horrific torture. His wife, Sabina, in a slave labor camp in Romania. As I spent time with them in their old age, I never met human beings like them. The, there was a Christ-likeness about them. There was something extraordinary, but they had been through hell. They had been through torture and suffering and had seen so much suffering in the Romanian church. And Richard Wormbron told a story that there was a, a pastor in Romania in prison and it, it was maddening to hear the screams of people being tortured, screams and moans and cried day and night. He was overwhelmed and, and he cried out to the Lord. And this is his own experience. I'm not making a theology out of it, but this was his experience. He cried out to the Lord and he said, he said, Lord, could I just have a respite? Could, could you just lift me out of this prison cell for a moment just so I could come into your presence and, and just get out of this, the, the pain and the screaming and the agony? But as he began to ascend in his spirit into the presence of God, the closer he got to God, the louder the cries. And he said, Lord, is, is it heaven a place of joy? Well, of course it's a place of joy. And in his presence is fullness of joy. And the, the angels are continually rejoicing before him for over one sinner who gets saved. That's happening day and night. And, and yet, it's not only joy. How can there be only joy when there's so much suffering and pain? Uh, are we not created in the image of God? And, and, and are we not called to grieve with those who grieve and mourn with those who mourn? Do we think our God is just always having a party? as his people are suffering and hurting and dying. And when he, this prisoner says, Lord, I, I thought heaven was a place of joy. And in this vision, the Lord says to me, you've misread the scripture. Have you not read in Exodus 2 that the cries of the children of Israel came up to me? Have you not read about Jesus that he was a man acquainted with grief and sorrow and pain? I, I want you to look at some verses with me. God wants to share his heart with us. Leonard Ravenhill was the greatest man of prayer I ever knew. He died in 1994 at the age of 87. And God supernaturally connected us when he was 82 years old. I was 34. God supernaturally brought us together. And I was overwhelmed when he asked me if I would be his friend. Praying with him was like nothing else I'd ever done, the, the depth of his heart, the depth of his devotion, the brokenness, the burden that he carried. I, I saw him preach when he was 82 and frail to, to four and a half thousand people in Anaheim, and he, he couldn't finish his message, his message of repentance. And he couldn't finish the message because weeping and crying broke out in the congregation. And, and there was, it was a conference, all these people, their leaders, believers, and, and he couldn't finish preaching. The whole place was like a battleground. Everybody on their face, weeping, wailing through the whole building. He couldn't finish preaching. But it's because of the depth in his heart. You can't give what you, you don't have. If we have a superficial relationship with God, a relationship of just what's in it for me, and I just want to be blessed and happy and, and prosperous, and we don't, we don't care about suffering and burden. We don't care about what's happening to others. We, we don't care about sharing God's heart. We're not going to impact people. You can only impact others to the extent God has impacted you. Leonard Ravenhill came up to speak at our congregation in Maryland and some churches in the area. 82 years old, he stayed at our home with his wife Martha and son Paul. And as he was leaving on that Monday morning, 
On the way out, he said, Mike, I'm asking God to trust us with a little more of his travail. And I thought, what a concept. That it's something sacred that if you're close enough to him and serious enough and mature enough, he's saying, I'm going to share a little more of my heart with you. Come on, those of you who are married, you share things with each other that you won't share with other people. You share things individuals with a circle of close friends that you wouldn't share with a stranger. And a lot of us have relationships with God, especially in America, where we're more strangers than intimates. We, we kind of go to God to, to get blessed and have our needs met and, and keep our life happy, but, but we don't want to really hear his heart. Let's look at a few other verses I mentioned this from Exodus 2, but let's, let's just read this. Spiritual reality here. I'm not talking about walking around depressed. I'm, I'm not talking about the attack of Satan. I'm talking about an intimacy with God where his heart becomes our heart. An intimacy with God where he trusts us enough to share some of his travail. So the children of Israel in Egypt, in bondage, Look at what it says, verse 23 of Exodus 2. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. Go over to Judges, Judges chapter 10. Another call for repentance after Israel falls into sin, after Israel's committing idolatry and their call to turn back. Verse 15, the Israelites said to the Lord, we have sinned. Do with us whatever you think best, but please rescue us now. Then they got rid of the foreign gods among them and served the Lord, and he could bear Israel's misery no longer. God's heart burdened and affected because of the suffering of his people. Go over to Isaiah chapter 22. The prophet sees a vision of judgment coming on Jerusalem. The prophet sees in front of his eyes what's going to unfold, and he's devastated. Isaiah 22. And look at what he says in verse 4. Therefore I said, turn away from me. Let me weep bitterly. Do not try to console me over the destruction of my people. And John Calvin commenting on that said that what befalls the church, the sufferings that God's people go through, should affect us as if it happened to each of us individually. Some years ago, I noticed that my wife Nancy just didn't seem to be herself and I asked her, I was on my way out the door one day going to my office. I asked her, hey, hon, is everything okay? Are you all right? She goes, yeah, yeah. Okay. Go about my business. A few days later, late at night, laying in bed, just about to fall asleep, just about to, hon, uh, everything all right? You okay? Yeah. Mm. Okay, I'm out. I'm asleep. A few days later, it's the middle of the day, nothing's going on. I sat down with her. I said, hey, hon, are you okay? You don't seem yourself. She said, oh, here's what's going on. And she started to unburden herself and tell me everything that was going on. I said, well, hon, how come you didn't tell me the other day? She said, well, you didn't care. She said, if you cared, you wouldn't ask because you're on your way out the door or right before you fall asleep. In other words, I was not worthy for her to share her heart. I did not deserve here if I, and, and it's true. Hey, everything, everything okay? Yeah, I'm going through the crisis of my life. Okay, I'll see you later. <laughs> but, but that's how many of us are with God. He would gladly share more of his heart with us if we really wanted it, if we really cared that deeply. Look, I've said for years that the American gospel is basically, this is who I am, this is how I feel, and God is here to please me. And the biblical gospel is this is who God is. This is how he feels. And we're here to please him. 
I'm thinking back almost 25 years ago, I got overwhelmingly burdened with the suffering of the world. And I'm normally full of faith and hope and optimism and, and today's good, tomorrow's going to be better. I mean, it's just the way I live. It's the way I think. It's the way I feel. I, I have this, I don't care what bad news I get hit with, I almost bounce back always with seeing the redemptive side of it. People tell me something absolutely horrific and I'm immediately thinking, okay, here's how God could redeem it. Here's how good could come out of it. It's terribly painful. I'm going to weep with you now. But man, I could see something good coming out of it. I mean, I live like that. It's just my, my spiritual reflex. And I'm, I'm constantly dealing with difficult issues, with hard issues, with, with some of the worst things happening in the world and the society around us. And, and because of that, I have to be wired a certain way because otherwise you, you, know, you lose your mind, you get depressed. And instead, I'm always full of faith and confidence and, and we can take the land and Jesus is going to do it. And I live like that all the time. I just got overwhelmingly burdened. There was so much suffering and pain in the world. I mean, at any given moment, every, every second of every day, there's agony. Every second of every day, people are hurting, people are dying, children are starving, someone's being kidnapped, someone's being tortured, some, some terrible diagnosis, a sudden car wreck. I mean, every second of every day, something terrible is happening. That's the reality. And, and it's impossible for us to even grasp that. In fact, one of the challenges today is we're getting more news than human beings are capable of handling. That the constant bombardment, if here's the latest episode, just watch it on your cell phone as it, as it unfolds. Read this here. It's this constant bombardment. It's, it's more than we can take, more than we can handle. But I just became overwhelmed. And one of my friends, we lived in Maryland, and one of my friends from Long Island was on the phone with me. And he never heard me talk. He goes, Mike, I'm, I'm going on to a fast. I'm going to start fasting. I want to come and just pray with you for a few days. And, and so he's fasting and feeling this burden. And, and suddenly the Lord just begins to show me he's, he's sensitizing my heart because he wants to take me deeper. You can't live like that all the time. But, but look, what does scripture say in Ecclesiastes 3? There's a time to mourn and there's a time to dance. So there are seasons. I'm not talking about being depressed. I'm not talking about just in our, in our own lives where we're going through ups and downs. There are seasons where God will share something with us and it's overwhelming and you feel like there's no way out of this. But what I learned is, okay, go with that because those who sow with tears will reap with joy. Amen. It's out of feeling the weight and feeling the agony and feeling the pain. It, it, it's out of that that we get to this place of brokenness and prayer and crying out. And boom, when the answer comes, it's glorious. I've seen over the years that some of the most important things in my life have been birthed out of that agony and that desperation. What does it say in Romans 8? That we don't know how we ought to pray, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us, through us, with groanings that can't be uttered in human speech. And the Greek word used for groanings there is the same word for groanings that I just read from Exodus. The groaning, the pain, the sigh of Israel went up to God. And that's how, think of it, that's how the Spirit prays through us. That's the pain of the burden. And God's looking for people who will share his heart. He's looking for people that will be more intimate with him. He's looking for people that are not like me on the way out the door asking my wife how she's doing, but, but sit down and look in your eye because we care and we carry it and it matters. I want to read a quote to you from Basilea Schlink. She was a Christian leader in the days of Hitler, a courageous woman that stood up to the ugliness of the Nazis, a great friend of Israel, great woman of prayer for the Jewish people and then the nation of Israel and she found out what was called the evangelical sisterhood of Mary where these women just devoted the rest of their lives to, to prayer and and service Basilea Schlink said this anyone who loves as much as God does cannot help suffering and anyone who really loves God will sense that he is suffering you think, well, what does that even mean? How can we comprehend that? But again, if we're created in his image, if, if Jesus shows us who the Father is, 
then until full redemption has come, there's a pain in God's heart. We had offices in Maryland that were right across from a funeral parlor. And sometimes on my way out, there'd be a funeral about to take place and people showing up and loved ones seeing each other and you're, you're, they're holding each other and crying. And, and I would pray a little prayer on the way out. I'd see it, Lord, comfort them, be with them in the midst of this, let light come out of the darkness. But that was it. I went on with my day. Well, because I didn't know anybody. I didn't know the people. But, but if it's someone you know, then it's a whole different story. When you hear it's a loved one of yours that was taken, then it's a whole different story. Well, how does God feel? If God himself is love, how does he feel? She quoted, Bessel Schling quoted a Japanese Lutheran theologian named Kazo Kitamori. He wrote a book called The Theology of the Pain of God after World War II. He said, the heart of the gospel was revealed to me as the pain of God. This revelation led me to the path which the prophet Jeremiah had trodden. And he quotes Jeremiah 31, 20. I just want to read that to you. Jeremiah 31, 20. Listen to what God says here. Is not Ephraim my dear son, the child in whom I delight, though I often speak against him, I still remember him. Therefore, my heart yearns for him. I have great compassion for him, declares the Lord. Even as I'm rebuking Israel and it's saying, that's my boy, that's my kid, my heart still yearns for him. Kitamori said this, Jeremiah was a man who saw the heart of God most deeply. He said, I was allowed to experience the depths of God's heart with Jeremiah. We dare to speak about this pain of God. We must pronounce the words, pain of God, as if we are allowed to speak them only once in our lifetime. Those who have beheld the pain of God cease to be loquacious, seek to be wordy, and open their mouths only by the passion to bear witness to it. There are passages in Jeremiah, like Jeremiah 9, where God says, call for the wailing women. In, in the ancient Middle East, you still even have the custom, but you would have mourners. You would have people who would be professional mourners. They would come and weep and, and wail at a funeral. And he says, call for the wailing women to come and let them weep and wail over us. And when you realize, wait, wait, hey, it's God inviting them to come and wail over us. Who's the us? And some Jewish interpreter said the us is, is God and the people. Wail over us. We're experiencing this pain together. So yesterday, we wake up to shocking news. The darkest day in the history of, of modern Israel. An absolute shocking series of events. So it was Sukkot, which is tabernacles. And this is a joyous feast. And the last day of the feast is a special time of rejoicing. In Jewish tradition, it's known as Simchat Torah, the joy of the Torah. And this is when the Torah cycle is finished, reading the, the Torah through annually in the synagogue. Of course, Jews study much more than that, but this is done annually. And when the cycle is completed, it, it works out to finish at this time. So it's a special time of joy, celebration. And you can go to the communities with lots of Orthodox Jews and there's be hours of dancing in the streets and it's the high point of celebration. It was also a Sabbath. 50 years ago, the first Sabbath of October was the Yom Kippur War. Israel caught off guard. Just as America was caught off guard 9-11, these things happened tragically. Israel was caught off guard and on the holiest day of the year is there in synagogues praying and fasting they were attacked primarily by Egypt and others, and it was terrible bloodshed and a dark, dark time in Israel's history. Well, Israel just celebrated its 75th anniversary, and here this was the 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur, almost to the day. And Israel was caught completely off guard by an invasion from Hamas, by land, by sea, by air, even in these paragliders coming in. 
and then thousands of bombs being dropped. And it's, it's a massive failure of Israeli intelligence. It's a shocking failure because something like this would require months of coordination and planning, at least. And there's clear evidence. In fact, Hamas has said, yes, Iran is with us in this. There's speculation that as Israel gets closer to a peace agreement with Saudi Arabia, Iran is trying to sabotage everything. You say, why would Israel and Saudi Arabia have peace? Why would Saudi Arabia want it? Because the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And Iran is considered the arch enemy of Saudi Arabia and these other countries because the Saudi Arabians and, and most of the other Muslim countries are, are Sunni Muslims and Iran is Shiite. And that division goes back to the earliest generations of Muslims. So the, the, the difference between Sunni and Shiite Muslims is deeper than the difference that Muslims have with Israel, many of them. So that's what's happening here. That could be some of what's going on. But I begin to get reports as they've invaded, just taken over small towns and, 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 and kibbutzim, these, these collective farms and communities where people live. And you're hearing these horrible reports. And at first, it's, it's 40 dead and 100 wounded. You thought, what? No. How could this be? And then the reports start pouring in. They're just taking over communities and just slaughtering people in cold blood. Just walking into the home, killing the mother, the father, the kids, killing the grandparents in three generations. Boom, boom, just slaughtering them. One of our friends sends out a report from Israel and says they're friends of ours with terrorists in their home right now. They were hiding. They had to hide for three hours before the terrorists left. Somehow they, they, they weren't found. The reports start growing. Over 250 dead. Over 1,900 wounded. And hundreds, apparently, taken hostage. This has never happened. This has never happened. And you have to realize with these numbers that, that the Jewish population of Israel is, is almost one-fiftieth, more than one-fortieth the size of, of America. In other words, this is much more devastating than 9-11. Picture 9-11 Picture the casualty numbers being substantially higher than the horrors that, that they were. It touched our family. My, my wife's brother, Douglas, was killed in the Twin Towers. Multiply those numbers, but then think of thousands of Americans taken hostage to Afghanistan. I mean, this is the horror of what's happened. But you see some of the videos. Here's a young Israeli woman. being they, they got her boyfriend with hands behind his back, carrying him away, and she's being taken away on a motorcycle, screaming, don't kill me. Now interviews with the father, weeping. The family wanted the pictures to get out to see what's happening. Another family said, that's our daughter. There she is. She's stripped naked, soldiers sitting on top of her. The people spit on her as they go drive through in Gaza. Bodies of Israeli soldiers just being stamped on and trampled by mobs as they celebrate. Children, babies taken hostage. There's grandmother in a wheelchair taken hostage. Nothing like this has ever happened. And, and, and the, the, the shock through the nation, the pain, the agony to the nation is overwhelming. And when you carry this, there is no earthly solution. There, there is no just snap your fingers and here's the solution. And, and our goal when we have a heart for Israel doesn't mean we're anti-Palestinian. Doesn't mean we just want to see them suffer. It's this whole vicious cycle here with, with no earthly solution at hand. And Israel obviously has to do whatever it can to destroy Hamas but in destroying Hamas, then, then innocent Palestinians suffer. And then whatever Israel has to do to free hostages, there are apparently many Americans among the hostages that were in Israel. I mean, it's a horrific situation. Paul in Romans 9 writes to the Romans, and, and he, he it makes himself so clear. He uses five different expressions to basically say, I'm telling you the truth. I'm not lying. My conscience confirms it in the spirit. I'm, not, I'm telling you the truth. He could have just written. He's an apostle. He could have just written. But five different ways he says, I'm not exaggerating at all. Why? I have unceasing anguish. 
I have continual sorrow in my heart for my people. That's probably part of why he says in 2 Corinthians 6.10 that we are sorrowful yet always rejoicing. The Paul who wrote Rejoice Always said, I have unceasing anguish in my heart. It, it, it's like some of you can relate to this as parents. You got one of your children very sick in the hospital, but it's the birthday for another child. So you have the party and you have the fun and you're happy, but you're in pain. That's what Paul said, sorrowful yet always rejoicing because he carried an unceasing anguish and pain because his people were cut off from the Messiah. And, and the reality is, God's promises to keep Israel, when he, he gave these clear promises that nothing could touch you, it was to a righteous nation. And, and Israel, although it's outstanding in many ways, is like every other nation. It, it's lost and it needs the Messiah. So there's not a guarantee of, of protection. It's not like we can just say, well, nothing could ever happen to Israel. Why? Why would we say that? So, so the, the trauma right now is unparalleled. The trauma across the entire nation. And you see all these cars of Israeli men up until a certain age, you all, unless you're religious and have an exemption, you, you, you stay in the reserves. So every Israeli man will serve three years, every Israeli woman two years in the military. That's mandatory for everybody. But then men, I think up to 45, still serve in the reserves. So they're all, I mean, thousands, tens of thousands drive to, to, to re-enlist and to go back out. And as they go into Gaza to try to destroy Hamas, the situation with the civilians, with the hostages makes it more difficult. Hamas and, and other terrorists for years have been famous, infamous for, say, putting their headquarters right in the middle of a hospital. So how do you take them out without hurting others? We would, we would get notes from when, when Israel was doing an operation in a difficult area. We would get prayer requests from our friends in Israel. Hey, our son's about to go in and pray because they have to follow all these guidelines to try to protect civilians, which puts them in danger. So the whole thing is just massively complex and, and difficult. And the only answer is God help. God help. I mean, people are sending out prayer lists that are very helpful and, 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 and good points to pray. But I look at it and say, God help. I don't know any other answer, but God help. So let me come back to the heart of God. Let me come back to the pain of God, to the burden of God, with him wanting to share his heart with us more deeply. And, and, and listen, it, it's wonderful to be pro-Israel and pray for Israel and celebrate, but what about carrying the pain? What, what about being real friends? What about saying, we understand ultimately that Israel's under attack because Satan wants to wipe the Jewish people out. Let me say it again. Jewish people need Jesus Yeshua like everybody else. And God cares for everybody in the Middle East. My heart is not to see everything go well for Israel and see Palestinians suffer. That's not my heart. It's not either or, right? Our heart is we're pro-God. Therefore, we want the best for everyone in the region. But the reason that Israel comes under such attack is because Satan wants to wipe the Jewish people out. That's the reality. And it's very clear to me, you stand with God, you stand against the devil. Therefore, you stand against these attempts. You stand against the spirit. And trust me, there are plenty of those who share enough hatred for Israel that they are rejoicing seeing these pictures of suffering. This one, I, I, I've tweeted some things out just saying, listen, whatever your position is, Whatever your position on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, if you rejoice over the slaughter, the butchering of elderly people, of women, of babies and children, your heart is evil. I've had people, I've had to block them one after another after another because of the Jew hatred and because of the lies. There's a lot of junk out there. There's a lot of ugliness out there. In the mid-80s, I was getting ready to preach at my home congregation and I had just ministered on a Saturday night. Uh, there was a church meeting I was asked to speak at. Didn't really know that much about them, but God gave me a very specific word for them, specific scripture and message. And they said, wow, that was exact. That verse is the verse God gave us. That message was exactly what God was saying to us. So I was really hearing the Lord clearly. I went back home. It was late at night on a Saturday night, and I started praying 
and I got overwhelmingly burdened. Little church of about 100 people. I was kind of the right-hand man to the pastor, like the prophetic leader with, with him. He was the senior pastor. I had some concerns. I felt there were some issues in his life that he was a little loose with. I had some concerns, but anyway, I get overwhelmingly burdened in prayer. Overwhelmingly burdened. Something terrible is going on here. Something terrible. He's opened the door to sin. Something is wrong. And then I get this terrible sense of foreboding. I'm just telling you a spiritual experience I went through. I'm not making a doctrine out of this. It's a spiritual experience I went through. I get this terrible foreboding. Oh, no. He's opened the door to the enemy. One of his kids is going to die. So I start praying passionately. It's very real to me. It's as real as if it's going to happen. I start praying passionately against it. And then this even more horrific foreboding hits me. Because you have interceded and gotten in the way of this attack, it's now coming your way. We had two little daughters. One of your children is going to die. It's like, no, no, that can't be God. It's not God. It's crazy. This is. So I'm, I'm, I'm telling the Lord, this can't be you. And immediately, well, what about Ezekiel 24 when his wife dies as a sign to Israel about going into exile and suffering and whatever I'm throwing up at God is something that's thrown back at me. So I'm, I'm in a panic now. This is totally real. I thought, I'm not hearing. And God reminds me, you heard accurately earlier tonight when you preached, didn't you? You were in the spirit earlier. You heard earlier. So I, I'm so, uh, such a uh, overwrought. It's about 2, 2.30 in the morning. I wake Nancy up. I, our bedrooms are upstairs, ours and the kids. I wake her up. I said, honey, someone's going to die. And I have, someone's going to die. I was just overwhelmed. I wake my wife up in the middle of the night. So she gets up, we go downstairs, we're praying, and suddenly I just get on my face and begin weeping and sobbing uncontrollably for my daughter's life, just weeping, sobbing. And then I hear the Lord. I mean, I was hoping in the back of my mind that this was the case, but, but I had a feel at first. God said to me, I wanted you to pray for the church as if it was your own child dying, because that's how I feel. And I, I, I mean, the relief, you can imagine the relief. Went up and kissed my daughter on the head while she was sleeping. But that sense of relief, but it was that real. It was that real. It was that deep. And the next morning, pastor and his wife came in. I sat him down. I just gave him the strongest rebuke I've ever given any human being. Something was wrong here, man. Something was pleaded with him. And he looked at me like, there's no, no big deal. We're good. Not long after that, he Took off with another lady, destroyed his ministry. Just a horrible story. All right, so it's about five years later, 1991. I'm speaking with Mike Bickle. He's got a conference, an Israel conference. Some of my friends are there. And um, opening message, Ruven Doron, a dear Israeli brother, speaks about the dry bones of Ezekiel. No, I'm sorry, speaks about the book of Ruth. And talks about, just had a baby. He and his wife had another baby, six weeks old, Rachel. And, and he said she's this type and sign of Israel. And begins to talk about that. And it said the church has to be a Ruth. Like the Gentile church has to be like a Ruth. The Gentile to help birth God's purposes for Israel. It was a beautiful message. But I remember he mentioned especially about his daughter. And then he brought another message. And then I was going to speak the next day. And here he spoke about the dry bones of Ezekiel. And Towards the end of the message, he said something that struck me as very odd. He said his daughter Rachel was born during the Gulf War, found out subsequently that he knew it was going to be a girl, but he thought if it was a boy, he would have named her Israel. He said, because she's a type and sign of Israel. She represents Israel. And, and he said she was born during the Gulf War. There was a storm in, in Iowa where they were. And, and, he, and he said she carries the pain and the wounds of Israel. And when she gets older... She's going to need to get inner healing. And I thought, that's, that's, I don't know where I stand theologically on that. I just thought, that's, that's odd. I just listened. Well, I, I go back to, to the house where I'm staying, actually with David Ravenhill, Leonard Ravenhill's son. Standing at his home, and I've, I've preached without notes for decades. I've taught whole years of classes without decades. Just a lot of stuff is in my head when God gives me an idea. Everything falls into place. But I feel stirred. Get up and write notes down. 
So I start writing these notes down for the message, a baptism of tears for Israel. Start writing it down. And I, I had read the words of a Scottish Presbyterian. They were having a conference and talking about Israel's salvation. And they said, what's the great pressing need in, in Jewish ministry? They said, more tears, more tears. So my message was the need of a baptism of tears for Israel. And the Lord lays on my heart, share the story about your daughter. And I protested. I said, Lord, I can't do that. There are a thousand people. I don't know them. They're strangers to me. I know very few people. This is too intimate. And he said, share the story about your daughter and tell the people they must pray for Israel as if it's their own child dying because that's how God feels. So I said, yes, Lord, then fell asleep. On the way to the meeting, David Ravenhill and I barely talked. He realized I was just kind of caught up in focus, so we didn't talk much. We get there, and something just seemed funny in the atmosphere. Something didn't seem right. Mike Bickle sits down next to me. He, says, he said, Mike, he said, uh, I can't stay. He said, something really wild happened, and, and I have to go. And I said, what? He said, well, Ruben and Mary Lou woke up this morning, and their baby's dead. I said, what? The baby girl's dead? He said, yeah. When I was with Mike and his wife a few years ago, they were saying, yeah, we remember, we remember we were in the room next to them when we heard the screaming. It's no known cause, just gone. And he said, I don't know if, when you want to make the announcement. I said, oh, I, I know exactly when to make the announcement. And I finished the message. I spoke it with brokenness and pain, calling for a baptism of tears for Israel and for God to deepen us as believers and take us past our superficiality. And then I told the story how God wanted me to pray for the church as if it was his own child dying because that's how God feels. And here we've been hearing about little Rachel as a type and sign of Israel. And I said, I've got a terrible announcement to make to you. And I share it with everyone. You just picture the devastation, the shock. I said, and God, God wants us to pray for Israel as if it's his own child dying because that's how he feels. I said, so please, let's pray for Ruven and Mary Lou. And let's pray for Israel. And the place just dissolved and wailing and screaming, as you can imagine. Right now, Israel's in the greatest crisis it's been in in its modern history. And in a horrifically hellish situation and who knows what's happening with hostages and what could come out of it. Israel needs our prayers right now. And God would really like to share some of his heart with each of us. So I'd like you to stand to your feet with me. I'm going to pray and then Pastor Chris will come up. Let me remind you again, those who sow with tears reap with joy. There was actually greater joy in the worship in the second service than in the first. And I believe it's because we were praying with a burden in the first. I don't walk around depressed, hopeless, but there are times when we have to just weep. And it doesn't mean work something up, but as God burdens you, please pray these coming days. However he burdens you to pray, whatever aspect, if you don't know how to pray, just say, God help, pray in the spirit. Israel needs your prayers right now. Israel needs the Lord. I mean, this be a time when, when Jew and Muslim, Palestinian, Israeli, others in the region, everyone turns to God because there is no other hope. Abba, Father, share your heart with us. Take us deeper, I pray. Give us your heart for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Give us your heart for all the people in that region. And we're asking you, Abba, Abba, Father, help, help. Stretch out your hand and do what only you can do. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.